Hi, Stanwood. Thanks for joining me today. Hi, Tasha, and thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, I'd love it if you could just share with everyone your own background and history, uh, you know, how you got to where you are today with Tai Chi and Qigong, but also just your life and your personal background to whatever extent you'd like to share. Sure. So uh, I'm from Michigan originally, Ann Arbor. I was born and raised there. Um, I sort of grew up uh, a classically trained musician, violin and piano and a little bit of clarinet. And uh, I went to University of Michigan there in Ann Arbor for a couple of years after I graduated high school. And then I decided I didn't want to be there anymore. <laughs> so then I, um, I came to Boston to come to the Berkeley College of Music. Um, and so I graduated in 93 from Berkeley. And my, and I, my career sort of took this odd convoluted path. Um, so right out of, right out of uh, college, I got a job, job at WGBH Public Radio doing in their closed captioning department. And I was there for about seven years, I think. And then after that, I sort of went off into, I was, that was right in the, I left WGBH right in the middle of the internet boom of the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. And, and so I um, got some, got jobs at uh, doing online marketing at uh, various web, uh, web companies, uh, internet companies. Um, got laid off from two of them and um, so ended up the, the, the last office job I held was uh, doing uh, email marketing for this uh, online gambling company and I, that was during that time that I also discovered Tai Chi so I started um, uh, sort of transitioning into this idea of doing Tai Chi full time and so that's what I did in 2011. I sort of left the rat race behind for good and, uh, and uh, started teaching Tai Chi full time. So I've been doing that ever since. Wow, wow. Um, why did you become interested in Tai Chi and, and Qigong in the first place? Well, so I had, I had always I'd always dabbled in martial arts when I was a kid, tried all different kinds of things. After I came out here to Boston, also kind of dabbled, you know, never really got serious about anything until I discovered um, Tai Chi. I discovered Tai Chi a little late in life, right? at 35 years old. You know, like a lot of young people, I thought Tai Chi was for old fogies, and senior citizens, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I discovered Tai Chi first in 2002 at this Kung Fu Tai Chi school I was going to. Um, that guy turned out to be a complete sociopath and pathological liar, so let's, we won't talk about him. But then, uh, so 2003, um, I landed at my first real Tai Chi school with Dr. Peter Wayne at the Tree of Life Tai Chi Center in Boston. Um, and that's the, that's the Chen Men Ching style of form. And then I also started uh, 2005, I started um, studying Chen style Tai Chi. I went, to a, I went to a seminar in which coincidentally where I first met my wife and so I met my wife and met Chen style Tai Chi at the same time. Um, and so I started studying that. And then in 2006, um, I met my Sun style Tai Chi teacher, Tom Duterm in Boston, when he was here getting his, his uh, MBA at MIT. And so I studied privately with him for about a year and a half before he graduated and left. Um, yeah, but so it wasn't until 
so it wasn't until I discovered Tai Chi that I, that I really like, wow, I really loved it. I didn't think I would like it. I just sort of decided what the, what the heck, I'll try it. And I tried it, loved it. And that's when I started first really getting serious about any sort of mind body or martial arts practice. What did you first love about it? What made you fall in love with it? Um, I don't really know. I guess just the, the slowness and the med meditative aspect of it. I think I would have any interest in, but I guess this, it was just, uh, just that part of it, just the, the, the slowness and the fluidity and the meditative part that, uh, yeah, that really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. Now, I originally met you because of Tom, who I'm also friends with and has also taught me several things. And um, he had spoken very highly of you. And then, of course, I was looking for uh, a chance to learn the Sun Tai Chi form. And uh, he mentioned that I could take classes with you. And um, I'm just very curious. I think Tom has been a really big influence on my life. And so I'm very curious what it was like for you to study and train with him, what you remember of that time period, what he was like as a person, what he was like as a teacher, anything that you feel like you might like to share about that? Oh, I, I love Tom. Um, um, you know, I, I, I first met him in, in Boston, like I said, he was at MIT getting his MBA. He's one of those disgusting people that can do everything. <laughs> he was <laughs> MBA, he paints and draws, he plays music, he's fluent in Chinese, he's getting fluent in Japanese, you know, he's younger than me. Um, but it was really, he's just such the, the sweetest, sweetest guy. And, and uh, it was just so, so really not so wonderful studying privately with him. Um, and he's just, just really, really friendly and sweet and, and patient and, and, you know, as, as much of a friend as a teacher. Um, and I was really sorry to see him. He, he, he graduated and moved to California and started working for Google, of course. Um, and, you know, I was really sorry to see him go, but I, I still try and make it out to California every, every couple of years or so to, uh, brush up with him. Do you have any, uh, stories from your time training with him in Boston or California that stick out? Um, not off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we, we studied the sun style stuff. He also studied, taught me a little bit of the, of the Lee style Tai Chi stuff mm -hmm. that he, um, studies in China with Li Lian Kang. Um, But he's just just really just really um, accessible. I mean, he'll he'll teach you as as fast as you want to go. You know, he he's, he doesn't. You know, he was he's trained very old school in China. But he he's, but he doesn't do that sort of old school thing where you know I'm only going to teach you what you I think you should know and 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 that kind of thing. He'll just teach you as much or as fast as you as you want to go um and he's just very accommodating very open um yeah and i just so i just love my my time in boston with him and i i loved every time going out to the train with him in in uh, california mountain view mm -hmm. where he lives in oh, los altos now is where he moved to mm -hmm. um and uh yeah it's, it's really, it's really a pleasure training with him. Mm -hmm. I love, I love just being with him and just being around him. Me too. That's why I ask about him. So, um, yeah, so I imagine some folks watching or listening to this will not know very much about the internal martial arts and, uh, you know, about Tai Chi and Qigong and the relationship between those and uh, also their relationship to say Bagua and Xingyi. And so I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about what the internal martial arts are and how they relate to each other. Sure. So the, the three Chinese internal 
martial arts are Tai Chi, or really should be pronounced Tai Ji with the J sound, which is how it's phonetically pronounced in Mandarin Chinese. Uh, Ba Gua Zhang and Xing Yi Qian. Um, and coincidentally enough, it was Sun Lu Tang, the founder of Sun style Tai Chi, was the one who sort of declared those three, the, the three Chinese internal arts. Um, and I think everybody else just kind of picked up and followed that, which always made me curious and made me wonder if, if Sun Lu Tang had studied three other different arts, like, like Tai Chi and, and, and Praying Mantis Kung Fu and Bai Ji Qian, whether we'd be calling those three things the, the Chinese internal arts, you know, sort of like he, he'd said it and declared it and everyone just sort of followed suit. So there's an internal element to all the Chinese Kung Fu and martial arts styles. So, um, you know, it's almost a little bit misleading to separate them into internal and external styles. Can you say um, what's meant by an internal aspect or element? Yeah, so, so you know, so supposedly the internal martial arts, Tai Chi and Bagua and Xing Yi, um, are more predicated on the development of Qi and energy primarily over muscular strength and speed, um, like what you would typically think of as Kung Fu or Taekwondo or Karate or any of that other stuff. Um, but like I say, you know, all, all of the, all of the so-called Chinese external styles all, all have this internal component. Um, and the, and the, the internal styles also very much have this external component, a, a component of speed and power and strength training and and so it's it's you know it's it's almost like just they're just coming up the two sides of the mountain to, to arrive at the same peak um but you know labels being what they are that's that's what the world has now um uh bagua is sort of characterized by i think you know most people are who are familiar with Tai Chi have sort of seen it or, or in some form or another. Um, Bagua and Xing Yi are, are much less well known. Um, Bagua is, the, the hallmark of Bagua is circle walking, you know, where you were practicing walking in a circle and then changing. And it's those changes that are sort of the, the sort of martial component, so to speak, how you're sort of changing direction, changing angle of attack, you know, getting out of the way of an attack. Um, I always say Bagua is sort of all about outflanking or outmaneuvering your opponent so that you end up to the sides of them or behind them. And Xing Yi is sort of the most external of the three. It looks the most like Kung Fu. Um, you know, just looking at it, you might not think it was an internal art it's hard and fast yeah so so Xing Yi is is less about out maneuvering or outflanking your opponent as opposed to just going right through them just bulldozing them mm -hmm. straight line right so on the surface it's sort of the the most um obviously sort of speed and strength and, and power mm -hmm. um but again all three have have roots in in Chinese medicine and the idea of developing qi, yin yang theory, the five elements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, all of these, all of these uh, martial arts internal practices or external practices even, um, I think of them as a subset of qigong. And people, I get this question often, what's the difference between Qigong and Tai Chi? Um, so Qigong is much older. Qigong has been around for a couple of thousand years. And there, there are scrolls and documents dating back that far, um, showing people doing just these, 
these sort of calisthenics for health. Um, and the Chigo universe is, is much bigger. You know, there's meditation and there's stuff that's sort of slow and flowy stuff that kind of looks like stereotypical Tai Chi. Um, there's a lot of self massage and drumming and, and swinging and get the chi pumping. Um, there's more, there's more um, bigger, bigger, bigger size, bigger range, calisthenic stretching kind of exercises. So it, it runs the sort of the whole gamut. And so the simplest, it, it's a very, you know, I could, we can go on talking about this for like half an hour, the difference between Tai Chi and Qigong. Um, but I found the sort of simplest, you know, sort of one sentence Wikipedia um, definition is that Tai Chi is, is a subset of Qigong. It has all those um, um, principles of Chinese medicine and the cultivation and circulation of Qi. But Tai Chi just has the, the added element, the added component of, of the martial aspect and you know sort of using that chi in these certain directions and vectors and techniques for uh, martial arts and self-defense now most people have heard of taiji and qigong and many others will not have heard of bagua and xingyi but <clears throat> assuming that they were equally available and like you could take classes in all of them what would make someone want to do you know, one versus the other, if, if, if they were all equally available and you could take classes in any of them, what would make someone interested in one form of practice over another? Well, I mean, just sort of going off of what I know of people, mm -hmm. you know, probably younger people would be more interested in the, the faster, harder, cooler looking stuff, mm -hmm. like, like Xingyi and Bagua. Mm -hmm. I think they would probably tend to be more attracted to that um and then you know maybe the the this more middle aged to older people would be attracted to the the speed and, and health benefits of tai chi mm. um so that's sort of my my answer sort of based on on human human nature and human observation um of what people would want of what they would gravitate towards mm -hmm. um you know if i were if i were answering that more on a sort of prescription basis, I would probably say just the opposite, right? That older people need more faster stuff, more strength, more vigorous stuff just to, just to keep up their health. And younger people could use the slowing down and the patience, and they could use more of Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, fascinating. In the very first, the very first time I met you, I took a Qigong class with you that you did for us. And you spoke to the way that you teach Qigong. You said that like something to the effect of uh, many people teach Qigong with a specific form and a specific sequence of specific motions, but that for you, uh, any motion that was focused on relaxation or mindfulness could be seen as Qigong. Can you speak more about that and your style of teaching Qigong? Yeah, so my, my style of teaching Qigong comes from uh, Dr. Peter Wayne mm -hmm. here in Boston. Uh, he's also the author of the book, The Harvard Medical School Guide to Tai Chi. I highly recommend that. Um, so he, he, his, and his day job is doing Tai Chi, tai chi research, you know, He's the, the director of mind body research at um, Brigham and Women's Hospital, the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. And so his day job is just to, to write up research grants for mind body research to get them approved and, and then execute the studies. So I've been very, very fortunate, very lucky to be a part of that. And I've taught in many of his studies, um, you know, studying the, the results of the effects of tai, tai Chi on um, 
heart failure, COPD, elderly, um, balance impaired people, et cetera, et cetera. And so his style of teaching Qigong is sort of more westernized, more deconstructed, more evidence-based. Um, it's much more somatic. It's much more touchy-feely, which, which, you know, traditional Chinese uh, people and instructors don't really, don't really do touchy-feely. Um, um, and yeah, so I, I say that uh, I, anything, Qigong is, is anything done with mindful intent and mindful awareness of breathing. So while other people may have a more narrower definition of what Qigong is, you know, Qigong is, is only if you study this Qigong style or this Qigong set, you know, in my book, anything that's done with that kind of mindfulness is, is Qigong. <laughs> um, and so, and, and, and I don't, I never say, I never use the word warm ups. I mean, to me, there's no such thing as warm ups. Warm ups sort of imply that it's something less important that you're doing in preparation for something more important. Um, and, I, and I think if you use the word warm ups, you, you tend to sort of devalue or downplay or trivialize what the warm ups are. So warm ups are Qigong. Qigong are warm ups. You know, I, I never use the word warm ups. So even doing just simple things like rotating your wrists or rotating your ankles that you might call a warm up, you know, I call Qigong. Um, yeah, and so again, so this is a very uh, sort of somatic way of teaching. Um, you know, I, I use a lot, a lot of analogies, metaphors, visualizations, imagery, um, just directing people to inward, just really feel stuff all inside and outside of their body. It's very somatic. Um, you know, I've always thought as, as a Qigong instructor, it's my responsibility, it's my job to use my words to, to paint sensation into the bodies of my, my students. So, you know, again, it's sort of a more, you know, for lack of a better word, sort of more westernized, more, more touchy-feely approach, um, whereas traditional Qigong or Taiji instructors, masters, uh, Chinese instructors may, I'm not, I'm not trying to generalize here, but, but may be more sort of vague or obtuse or, you know, go meditate on the mountain for a year and then come down and tell me what you figured out, that, that sort of approach. Um, you know, my approach is sort of just to, just to try and, and, and get it in your body, to get it, you to feel it as soon as you possibly can and, and uh, to sort of lay it all out on you. You know, no, I'm not trying to hold anything back or, or have any ancient Chinese secrets, and, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You spoke to this earlier, but um, you said that like the drumming and the self-massage and the swinging are all chi generating activities, but can you say a little bit more about what those are and, and what the benefits are of those? So it's really just about just about stimulating movement of chi. I mean, just in a very sort of just a very explicit, you know, tactile, physical way, right? Just just drumming and vibrating the body, um, massaging or sort of over the surface of the skin, which also sort of it lights up your nervous system mm. with all the tactile sensations. Um, and then the swinging is just sort of, you know, just sort of getting stuff moving, getting stuff, the blood and the chi moving and pumping and, and, and joints going and tissues going. And so it's very, it's very, I don't want to say, it's sort of superficial, it's very physical and, and just very 
sort of simply superficially, physically, just moving stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, can you speak to sort of a similar question, but you've studied, if I can count, four styles of Tai Chi, is that right? Sun, Chen, Yang, and a little bit of Li, not in that order. Uh, can you speak to the differences between the Tai Chi styles that you have experienced? Um, yeah, so I've only studied Lee style a little bit with Tom, mm -hmm. um, so I, I won't, I won't, I don't really consider myself uh, um, a, a Lee style practitioner, um, mm -hmm. but I'll just speak to the, to the other three. Mm -hmm. Now, there are dozens and dozens in many styles of Tai Chi. People are, you know, inventing new styles and naming it after themselves all the time. Mm -hmm. But the, the big five original styles are sort of like the big three automakers of, the, of Detroit. And so it's uh, Chen style, Yang style, um, Chu Wu styles, and Sun style. Um, and so Chen style is sort of the oldest, it's sort of considered to be the, the, the mother of all the Tai Chi styles, although there is some controversy and debate about that, which I won't get into about new documents discovered and whether they're forgeries or not. And there's a whole big thing about that, um, about, about whether Chen style and Chen village really is the mother of all Tai Chi styles. But anyway, so Chen style being the, the oldest um, has the most sort of external or, or Kung Fu influence, right? Chen style is, is large frame Tai Chi. It's low, long, big postures, big hand movements, um, a lot of hard and fast punches and kicks. So it's the most external looking. Right? Um, and then Yang style is sort of the, is probably the, the most popular. I would say style in the world, and it's the style that most people associate with when they when they think about seeing Tai Chi or having seen Tai Chi before. Um, it's probably Yang style that you've been seeing, um, and that's sort of the first style to sort of sort of slow things down and and into what we into what we sort of typically think of or see as Tai Chi today. Um, and then the Sun style is the youngest of the big five. And the Sun style is, uh, so Yang style is sort of more medium frame, still medium frame, large frame, depending on which sort of branch you're studying. The, the two Wu styles and Sun style are more small frame, mm -hmm. meaning the footwork is very small, small steps, uh, small hand movements. Um, and, you know, I think what I like to say about Sun style is that it's probably the, the most accessible for elderly or people with any injuries or physical limitations because of its small frame nature. Um, and what I, what I really find interesting is, is looking, looking through the, the progression of, of the big five styles is just in fact how they they got smaller and slower over time um and you know you will find plenty of people who stay say that their style of tai chi is the best and i i don't you know subscribe to that at all i i don't have a best tai chi style or favorite tai chi style i think it's just different needs for different people or different appeals. Um, but again, I, I do find it interesting how things got smaller and, and slowed down to, with, this, with the Sun style at, at, the, at the very end of the big five. Um, and I do think that that says something about, you know, an internal practice a mind body practice and sort of what are the characteristics of that and what cultivates that 
maybe just a little bit more, a little bit better. Um, and and even even my Chen style, you know, I've sort of taken to, in my own personal practice, I've taken to shrinking down the size of it, the the the, the size of the footwork and the size of the hand movements, and and the speed of it. Um, and I find that to be really profound. Um, so the, I think there, there, even though I say, you know, there is no best style or I have, or favorite style, uh, I do think there is something to be said about what the slowness and the size does for the sort of feeling of internalization. Um, you know, a lot of people I see studying Chen style Tai Chi, they're doing what I call Chen style Kung Fu, hmm. right? They're, they're so enamored with how, with the, the kicks and the punches and, and it looks really cool. It looks really impressive, um, you know? And I think people get so caught up in that and they, they just, and they're, they're so caught up in the physicality of it. They, they just, cannot they're overlooking and they cannot get the internal aspect of it um the first time i saw sun style on a, on a youtube video or whatever but this is before i started studying with tom i was not impressed at all i was like oh this is like old man geriatric tai chi you know um but when i first sort of discovered tom online i i i, I knew i knew at that point luckily um, I knew enough, well enough at that point that even though it didn't look like much to me, if there was a Sun style teacher in Boston, I should check it out and check him out because there, I, I knew that there, there would be something beneath the surface. Mm. Plus the fact that Sun style teachers are um, kind of rare. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a kind of rare style. Mm -hmm. um, Chen, Chen and Yang styles are very, very ubiquitous. You find them everywhere. Um, Wu style is pretty, um, fairly popular as well. But the, but the other Wu style, the Wu Hao style and the Sun style are quite rare, especially in the Western hemisphere. Mm -hmm. um. Could you speak to why you teach Sun Tai Chi in particular? You, you said you don't have a favorite style, but uh, you do teach Sun Tai Chi. And can you sp say more about that and why you teach it? Well, I mean, it's it's um, it's not that I, I, I'm favoring it over the other two styles. Mm -hmm. I, I teach the, the Chen Men Ching form mm -hmm. at my teacher's school. So I just help him teach that style there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's no point in opening my own school to compete with him and teach Chen Menching style as well. Mm -hmm. And I did, in fact, have uh, a Chen style Tai Chi school as well as the Sun style school mm -hmm. going both at once at one time. Um, but it was it was just dividing my efforts too much. Um, and so I just decided to, to just stick with the with the Sun style. Um, and again, I also think it's, it's, you know, the, the Sun style again is a little more accessible, um, and does attract sort of more middle-aged to elderly for, for health, um, which is sort of the, the direction that my teaching sort of tends to gear toward. Um, you know, and, and when I'm, I'm old and decrepit and, and not able, barely able to do anything physical anymore, um, Sun, Sun style may in fact be the last form that I, that I'm able to do when I'm, when I'm old. Um, so I figured I would, I would stick with that as sort of my, uh, my, my one singular school, if I was going to have one school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If someone was a new student working with you, what would you want them to know about practicing Daiji and Qigong? Well, 
Um, so I would, I would say breathing is, is one huge thing. Um, you know, I, I always say and always joke that breathe, of, of the three, mind, body, and breath, breath is sort of the redheaded stepchild. Um, mind and body get all the glory because it's, you know, mind, body, meditation, mind, body, practice, mind, body, institute, mind, body, this and that. Um, but I think breathing is hugely overlooked and, and just just the, the breathing and meditation part of it is such a huge, huge percentage of, of the, the total mind body practice package. Um, so I, I think that's one big thing. And the other, I think the other big thing is, is consistent practice. Um, you know, like so many other things in life, it's about the cumulative effect, right? You, you don't, you don't take seven days worth of vitamins on Sunday and none the rest of the week, right? Or you don't get seven days worth of sleep on Sunday and none the rest of the week. It, be, about being healthy is about the, the consistent daily cumulative effect. Um, and so I think that's the sort of the, the two most important things I can think of off the top of my head. Hmm. And the, I, if there was a third thing, I would say, um, you know, Tai Chi and Qigong are not sort of classes or hobbies. You know, it, it's a complete way of life, a complete way of being, right? So it's being mindful when you're standing at the sink washing dishes or chopping vegetables or standing waiting in line at the grocery store. Right? All of that, any of that, walking to your car and back from your car, all of that and any of that is, is Qigong and Tai Chi. So, you know, it, it's about bringing that, that one hour of class or two hours of class that you do a week, however many hours. And even beyond that, you know, one hour or two hours of your daily practice, it's taking even beyond that right, into every sort of waking moment of your life. Um, so that's the, probably the, the third most important thing that I would stress. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that I've been interested in asking you about is about uh, what I would call a skill tree for learning Tai Chi. Are you familiar with that term? Uh, no. So it's the idea that you can have, uh, if you're learning something, anything at all, that there's sort of a, a sequence of things that you might learn, which they might be independent or like, you know, there's multiple branches, but then they accumulate in mastery of a skill and it could be a very long skill tree there could be multiple like nested skill trees but basically that there's some kind of uh intelligent progression of you start here and then you end here and what the path is between the beginning and the end and i've been curious about the sort of skill tree of learning uh the soon tai chi form and and just tai chi in general of course and it seems like um so this will be maybe a two-part question but um maybe there's there's sort of, in my mind, there's sort of two phases of like, uh, and this is just how I'm modeling it as someone new to it, right? Um, but there's sort of two phases of, oh, the first six, nine months, you're gonna spend learning the form and going through the steps and kind of internalizing the, just the physical motions into your body. And then after that, there's, there's sort of a progression of now that you know the form, you can do, go into the subtleties of the form and really that's where the real work maybe begins. Um, could you speak to maybe just the first part? What 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 is involved in learning the form, and what what, what is the form for those that don't know, and so on? And then we can use that as the basis for di talking about the subtleties of the form. Yeah. So I, I so I think I think you're right. There's sort of it is sort of a two part question there. Mm -hmm. um, I would say. Overall, just 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 sort of more ten thousand foot view of qigong and tai chi. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I, I I don't think of it or or wouldn't like to think of it as sort of this skill progression. 
you know, more generally about what you want to practice, what your body wants to do, what you can remember, and what feels good. Um, to a certain extent, the stuff that doesn't feel very good, what, what you know your body kind of needs, and you, and you know you need to kind of do that stuff anyway. Um, you know, so if we're, if we're looking sort of more generically at sort of well-being and health, um, I, I probably wouldn't like to think of it in terms of any, put any sort of, sort of, you know, progression on it, right? It's just all about doing what feels good, doing what you know your body needs, and having a consistent practice with that. And, and there, there's no, you know, there are many people, many of my students, and, and many other students, who only do the Qigong and never start Tai Chi form, which is totally fine, you know, and so all they do is the Qigong, all they do is just stuff, practices and stuff to move and, and um, keep them healthy and feeling good, cultivate their well being. And so in that sense, there's no progression, right? It's just, it's just doing, doing the same old stuff and maybe a little bit of new stuff for the rest of your life until the day you die. Um, now, in terms of sort of a more micro look at, at learning the form itself, which is where I think the question of progression is, is more uh, relevant. Um, yeah, you're right. So it's, it's, at first, it's just more about learning the mechanics of the form. And again, you know, the, I think one of the barriers to learning the Tai Chi form is memorization. I mean, it's, it's a large amount of memorization and movement practice. It's like learning the choreography of a dance. And some people are good at it and some people are not, and that's okay. And that's why I think some people just don't do the form. Um, but certainly you're learning the mechanics of the form is the first step and it certainly helps if you um, you can retain and practice and and memorize the movements. Um, and then after that, I think comes the the next step of form variations and, and what I love about. Tai Chi, tai Chi forms is just that in one form. To study one form, one style, their entire life. And doing just one form can be so, so rich. And so there are, once you sort of learn the whole mechanics of the form, then in, in some style, the way I teach in particular, the next step would be to learn the breathing pattern. Okay, so you learn the whole choreography and mechanics first, and then you go back and apply the breathing pattern, overlay the breathing pa pattern on the form. And then after that, I would say, then you start really diving into all the richness of variations that you can do with the form. And I have this, I have this document, this running document list that I keep of all the different things you can do with the Tai Chi form. Doing the whole form with different hand shapes, hand postures, um, doing, doing the whole form at different speeds, doing just the footwork only, no hands. Um, uh, using all kinds of props, you know, doing the form with um, a pair of broad swords or, or, you know, butterfly swords or Indian clubs or holding, you know, hand weights or ankle weights, um, doing the whole form in mirror image reverse. Um, and so there's just a whole
all the different ways that you can mechanically, physically do the form. And then once you get past that, or maybe I should say, maybe even concurrently with that all along, really, is the sort of more internal aspects, you know, the, the attention to, to breathing, grounding and rooting, um, the, the feeling of flow, um, the, the attention to connecting upper and lower halves of the body, um, and all that kind of stuff. And then I'd say then once you get to that point, then it's just practice, 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 you know, mm -hmm. practicing all the physical variations and then practicing all the internal aspects and so forth. I imagine that another option as well would be to sort of uh, cross train in a, in, in a different Tai Chi form. Is that is that right? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's part of the, for me, that's part of the value of studying multiple styles. Mm -hmm. And I highly recommend studying multiple styles. It may, again, it may not be for everyone, you know, for, for those people who don't have the time or who, who only have the capacity to memorize one form and get easily confused with another form or another style. That's okay. Um, but to me, the, the, the real the value is of cross training these other styles is every style emphasizes certain things. And so by by default, I don't I don't want to say they they they're lacking or deficient. It's just that by default, they're they're de-emphasizing other things. Um, and so the insight that you gain, I think, from one style and certain things that you can bring over into the other style, I think that's very, very valuable. Like, for instance, what I was describing before about taking my Chen style and shrinking it, you know, um, that sort of came from Sun style. Right? Um, and then vice versa, sort of the, the, the speed and power and explosiveness of Chen style, you know, you can apply some of that to Sun style too, so that doesn't get sort of lost or overlooked. What advice would you give someone who is cross training in multiple Tai Chi styles, maybe who's mastered say Sun Tai Chi from working with you and then is moving on to a different style or, or something like that? Um, I don't know. I, I, I would say just try to, you know, you know, don't, don't look right, you know, be creative, be flexible in your mind, again, about what, what qualities that you can sort of interchange between Tai Chi styles you know, um, what attributes. Because if you can, if you can take them all and sort of blend them all together, right, then maybe you're getting sort of a, a more bigger, complete package, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's, that's what I would just say. And, and um, you know, I, I definitely would not recommend sort of studying the same style, two different teachers or two different schools or something too similar, because that can get really confusing. I think it's actually um, easier to study another style or two, a second or third style that's very, they're, where they're very different from each other. Um, you know, sometimes I'll get people who, who have studied one, um, one style of Tai Chi with some other teacher and then come to a different school and and uh, I really applaud those people. I think they're very brave. Mm -hmm. I think that can that that can get the most confusing trying to sort of unlearn what you've learned from one teacher and, and you know, to do with this other teacher. I think it's much, much um, easier and probably more beneficial 
if you study two styles that are somewhat different. So maybe if someone was doing soon, like the Chen or the Yang styles would be a good thing to cross train in since it's pretty different. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. One thing I've been curious about training with you is, uh, and you've mentioned this in a class, but that, uh, you know, it is a, a martial form, but that that's not really emphasized in the way that you teach it. And uh, I'm curious about that and how, what it might look like to practice that specifically, like, like I'm traveling abroad right now, for example, right? And, you know, I am out on the streets of Europe and I'm, I'm sort of imagining that if I happen to be in a fight spontaneously, like that my mental model is like my body would just remember the motions that I've practiced, but that that seems sort of uh, like I would probably lose this fight and I'm hoping not to get in a fight, but I am, it's to me, it seems like if I'm going to spend all this time practicing a martial form, I it'd be good to have some sense of how I might apply it if I needed to. And I'd be curious to hear you to speak about that of like how you would apply the the martial side of the tai chi in a fight or or what that looks like exactly. Well, so a, a couple things. So so one, um, you know, I, I'm not promising that you that you will sort of naturally react in a very smooth and, and suave martial way, mm -hmm. um, but I do think there is something to sort of even if you do nothing but just sort of practice a slow Tai Chi form, I do think there was something to the sort of mental and emotional preparation aspect of that, if you ever get into a confrontation. Um, not even a physical confrontation, even just a, a, a verbal altercation, right? Um, and so I think that that has value. And I think, you know, I think you can find stories of people who only practice the slow flowing version of Tai Chi, but then they find they're, they're suddenly able to use it or apply it just sort of instinctively in, in a confrontation. Um, so the more, you know, if you're if you're talking about sort of the more you know traditional or hardcore or martial aspect of the training you know that would certainly involve push hands which i think is hugely hugely important um you know if you go really hardcore it, it would it might involve putting on pads and sparring and learning how to strike and and sparring at full speed um it was certainly it could involve weight training, you know, training with physical implements, just to, to sort of to strengthen uh, the body and the integrity of the body. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's Tai Chi and Kung Fu practitioners, you know, back, back hundreds of years ago, when they didn't have dumbbells and kettlebells, you know, they would they would lift rocks and buckets of water and, and, and do all kinds of physical training as well you know it, it kind of goes you can't um i don't think you can you can detach that from the internal training and even if you're doing tai chi just for purely for health external ex western exercise is great i i do it too you know weightlifting and cardio and all that kind of stuff um but the 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 push hands taiji push hands i'm going to go off of this for for a little bit um i do some push hands even in my chi, in, when we're when we're having in-person classes which has been a long time now um hopefully soon someday but in my in-person classes even in the qigong classes i do a lot of push hands and Taiji push hands can be um, competitive, where you're actually trying to quote unquote win and you know and throw or move your opponent off balance. But even the the cooperative version of push hands, where you're just 
with a partner and you're just learning to flow and sense together, that has just, Tai Chi push hands has just really changed my life in that regard. In the sense that Tai Chi push hands is a metaphor for life, for interpersonal relationships and conflict resolution, whether it be a physical altercation, a verbal altercation, uh, you know, an argument over the phone or by email. Um, you know, push hands is all is all about sort of that that mental and emotional resiliency of not getting of not letting someone push your buttons of not getting upset of not responding in an upset way. Um, so you know whether you're you're really talking about really hardcore martial training or not you know push hands is just is 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 i think really really hugely important and it's just such a wonderful has taught me push hands has, has just taught me so much um you know and, and it taught me uh, it, it was incredibly useful to me back when i did have a day job you know and interacting with co-workers and having disagreements and arguments with co-workers and how you respond to that um, and how you handle those situations. Um, I think push hands is, is really sort of um, a whole a whole another universe unto itself and uh, outside of the, 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 the typical Qigong and Taiji practice. Uh, you sort of alluded to this, but you know I haven't had a chance to practice push hands with you because I've trained you know ninety eight percent online with you. Um, can you just give me and whoever's listening an idea of what training in that looks like? Yeah, so push hands um, is basic, basically just about you're, you're touching with a partner and you're moving with a partner and just learning to sense. It's a little bit like, it can be a little bit like two person Qigong, right? But it's also about being more aware outside of your own body, learning to sense another person and how they're moving, when they're gonna move. Um, and it also can reflect back on yourself and that you get an even better sense of your of yourself and your own internal awareness when you are touching. I was saying that that it's called push hands, mm -hmm. but it's an awful, awful name for it mm -hmm. because it's not about pushing, and that's not really about your hands. Um, you know, if we were to rename push hands, maybe a better name would be sensing core mm -hmm. or sensing body right you're just, you're just getting learning more about your own body and also learning more about about sensing another person's not only their movement but their energy and their intention mm. and that's the part that you can sort of apply to you know real life everyday situations mm. you know how someone is is looking at you or moving towards you or talking at you, what their intention, what their intention is, sensing that and how to deal with that. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what uh, push hands looks like. And then at, at the, at the higher level, it can sort of evolve. And, and so these, these, these um, complementary push hands training is you're sort of just moving and flowing in these sort of uh, preset patterns, just to sort of um, just very basic movements, right? And then it can sort of evolve or devolve into more freestyle, where, you, where you're sort of randomly doing stuff in, in, no, in no particular patterns. And then it can evolve to the point where you're, you're now you're starting to get competitive and trying to push or pull or move your 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 partner off balance um 
And that that's really that is at full speed. It looks a little bit like stand up wrestling. Hmm. The, the, the full push hands. Hmm. You mentioned that you also find it useful to do Western exercise, cardio and weightlifting. And I know that on your website, you mention a few different things that you've been exposed to or studied. Uh, I found references to uh, Mary Bond, anatomy and movement, Tom Myers, anatomy and original strength fitness. And I'm just curious uh, what other movement practices that you've done or studied that, you know, people might not be familiar with like those one and, and how they sort of fit into how you think about movement and wellness. So um, a lot of, so Tom Myers is, um, is uh, very well known for his book called Anatomy Trains. And this, um, um, his, his work and research into the fascia, the connective tissue of the human body. Um, and I think that stuff is really fascinating and it's really important to know, get to know. Um, and, and fascia really is, is much like Taiji and Qigong, very, very holistic, right? Just so, so just sort of learning a little bit about fascia and connective tissue, I think can be extremely, extremely helpful um, to, to any practice, whether it's Taiji and Qigong or, or running or whatever. Um, Mary Bond also is sort of in the same vein. She does a lot of anatomy stuff, but she's also very much, um, she studied with Ida Rolf. And, um, and so she's very much um, into sort of combining that, that knowledge of anatomy with movement principles and, and movement for well being. And so she, I think she is. Um, just an incredibly knowledgeable teacher. She's amazing. Um, you know, I've become friends with her and she's just wonderful. I always tell her that she's, and she's written a couple of, uh, several fantastic books. Um, one is called The New Rules of Posture, which is not really a book about posture. I mean, it is, but it isn't. It's, it's much about much, much more than just posture. And her newest book is called Your Body Mandala. And I always, I always tell her, you know, especially those two books, th those two latest books, I always say to her, you know, you've, you've written the most Tai Chi, non Tai Chi books I've ever seen in my life. Because they're extremely, extremely applicable to, to just movement and well being. Because at the end of the day, I, I consider myself more broadly um, a movement instructor, right? Um, it, basically movement therapy or manual therapy, I mean, massage and, and Reiki and other kind of stuff. It's, it's the, the two broadest categories, right? So a, a move, I, what I am is a movement instructor, or if you want to parse it a little more finely, a mind body movement instructor. Um, and so her, her stuff has been incredibly influential. Okay? And, and again, Tom Myers and, and Mary Bond are more about um, anatomy, bones and joints, and fascia and connective tissue, sort of coming from that angle of it. And then there's another movement system I study called original strength. And that is more about um, coming at it more from the the neurology side and more about the brain and the nervous system mm. and more about sort of uh, strengthening, enhancing and stimulating the nervous system. And probably original strengths, they're, they're, they're one of their biggest things is, is um, called the, the big five, the big five resets, um, which, are, which are sort of rewinding us back to the child developmental sequence, right? Which is first eye movement, right? And then head movement, and then um, lying on the ground and rolling from belly to back and back to belly, 
and then getting up onto hands and knees and rocking back and forth, because that's the next thing that the baby does, right? And then finally crawling. And if there, if there, if there were a sixth reset, and the sixth thing would be getting up off the ground, right? Standing up and then getting back down, standing up and getting back down. So it's really all about rewinding back to that, that basic um, motor development and child development sequence of their neurology, which as, as adults, we've really kind of lost some of it, you know? I mean, there are so many people that I teach that, that can't get down on the ground anymore, that can't crawl, um, which I think is a really real shame. And so I think, you know, just being down on the ground and getting up and down from the ground is, is, is huge for, for neurology and neuromuscular strength. Um, and it's really ties it, it really fits in well with, with my um, sort of philosophy of teaching, and which is I sort of come at the whole Shigo and Tai Chi thing again with this sort of more westernized somatic approach but i think even more so than other teachers um, that have trained in the same vein as me i come from at it even with even more of this sort of anatomical sort of functional movement aspect um, you know you you could almost say that my my classes are are sort of like functional movement classes disguised as a qigong class really you know what is your own current movement practice like what are what kinds of things do you tend to do every day and what are you currently exploring or developing um i just bounce around for all kinds of stuff mm. you know i'm i i keep lists and spreadsheets i'm an incessant list maker mm -hmm. Um, and so I just have a list of all kinds of kettlebell and, and um, I use Indian clubs and all kinds of and I do body weight stuff. I do stretching kind of stuff. Um, I do a lot of uh, sort of self massage tools and implements. I think that's really important for um, for well being. Um, and then, of course, all the, all the Taiji and Qigong stuff, and I, and I can't do it all in one day, so I, I tend to just sort of um, sort of map out map out what I'm going to do that week, and maybe I stick to that, maybe I don't. Um, but I tend to sort of sort of cover the whole sort of bounce around the whole gamut across all of that kind of stuff. Is there anything that you're particularly interested in right now that's exciting to you? Um, I would say lately I've been getting a little more diligent about stretching, um, especially as someone who is older. Um, I think that that Stretching really makes me feel younger. Mm. Um, and I've also been lately working a lot with um, not heavy weights, but just lighter implements and props and just and just moving them um, in in sort of very practical functional ways. So I, I have a staff that's about 50 inches long that's very thick about an inch and a half thick um it's, it's heavy as staffs go it's about you know three pounds or so but but for for you know by weightlifting standards that's not very heavy um but just moving with that three pound staff in sort of very sort of functional movement kind of ways and sort of awakening my body in, in different in different vectors of, of movements with that um is something i'm also really having a lot of fun with right now. Uh, I'm curious if there's anything that's uh, 
related to what we've been talking about that you'd like to say more about or talk more about in conversation? Um, I mean, aside from all the, the movement kind of stuff that we've been thinking about, the cross training, I think one other important thing that we haven't touched on as much is um, meditation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, me again, meditation sort of is, is just in that bigger umbrella of Qigong. Um, but I think it's just hugely, hugely, again, hugely important to any kind of movement or exercise that you do, Eastern or Western, slow or fast weights or not. Um, you know, med I think meditation, when I think about meditation, I think about meditation as its own special state. You know, you can be awake or you can be asleep. And right in between is that sort of invisible dimension of meditation. Um, and the, you know, the, the, it has so many benefits, as I'm sure you know, just physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, whatever. Um, and it's, it's, it's this, this sort of little invisible place that, that so many people don't practice. You know, they're either all out with their weightlifting or running or whatever, or they're just lying down and resting or sleeping. And they never venture into this, this invisible realm right in the middle that that's, opens up into this whole other dimension of, of meditation. It's, it's a completely and utterly unique state of, of being. Um, my favorite way, lately, my favorite way of, I mean, I've, I, I always love standing meditation. Like that's one of my favorite things to do. Um, lately, I've also been doing a little bit of lying meditation. Um, Seated meditation is probably my least favorite of the three, <laughs> only because, probably only because it's difficult to find a good chair or a good cushion or a good stool that's really conducive. Chairs so are just terrible. It's hard to find a good cushion or chair for meditating for a significant length of time, you said? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, and chairs just generally suck, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so I, I find it the most difficult to get comfortable with a chair, or maybe it's just the particular chairs that, that I own. Mm -hmm. um, but standing meditation is incredibly profound. Um, and lying can be very, very restful and profound too. Um, lately, when I've been doing lying meditation, I've been using um, earplugs that's sort of a, a, a new thing for me, doing meditating or doing Tai Chi with the earplugs in, because that instantly turns your attention inward. It's like it's like uh, instant mindfulness, just add water. You know, mm -hmm. you put earplugs on and you can hear your own breathing, and suddenly you are just completely, immediately brought into your own body. Mm -hmm. Right? It, it's it's like almost like you've the earplugs sort of help you turn off to your external environment and immediately force you inwards. Hmm. Um, and so, yeah, doing lying meditation with earplugs has been really, really amazing. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's certainly a big part of my own background and interest is uh, having done extensive seated meditation and uh, on the one hand, noticing the power of standing meditation and also um, yeah having injuries with my body from seated meditation and just increasingly finding it less and less uh, enjoyable physically but noticing how good standing and lying down felt and then also knowing that um, like that traditionally doing standing meditation was kind of the preparation for things like 
doing a Taiji form or another internal martial art and wanting to explore that. And right now, certainly in my own body, standing and lying down and, and doing the Tai Chi form are, are the most um, enjoyable physical ways to do meditation practice. And uh, I'm certainly bringing in all of the skills and awarenesses that I've cultivated through seated practice and different techniques that I've done, but bringing them into the motion forms and the standing and so on. Yeah. So, so you, you've also found that, that seating, sitting meditation is, is least preferable among the three for you? Yeah, I think for me at this point in my own body, um, I really resonated with what you said earlier about like, it's about what finding feels good in your body and what, what you need to do. And um, I think the way I experience it is like, I've, I, I know I've done thousands and thousands and hours, thousands of hours of seated meditation at this point. And, uh, and, and as I said, injured myself from it and my body, it just feels like it's saying like, no, let's not do this anymore. So most of the time, I don't feel like doing seated meditation. When I do, it feels amazing. I do know how to sit still and sit comfortably and sit well. And so sometimes it's like my body's in the mood for that. And when I do, I, it's like, oh yeah, this is great. Um, but uh, most of the time I do standing every day. I do a lot of lying down practice. And of course I'm learning the Tai Chi form and those feel much better for my body, much more relaxed. And, and I think, you know, as someone who teaches meditation, um, I tend to say like, I think um, standing or lying down are really good options to have because for a lot of Westerners sitting just doesn't feel very good and uh, is uncomfortable physically. And I think it's also can bring up like emotional traumas and stuff like that. And um, you really have to find the posture that feels comfortable for you and your body. And it might not be seated meditation. So um, I, I, I think it's, I tend to talk about it as being overrated and overemphasized, especially in the context of, of Western practice, where it's like um, a lot of pain and no gain kind of thing or less gain. Um, and there's certainly a reason I think that it is emphasized it's 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 easier to be still and have your nervous system transformed and i do think it can be easier to enter concentration states and have deep shifts happen but uh those things are still possible in the other postures and there's other advantages to the other postures you know when you're doing walking for example it's easier to integrate into motion or when you're lying down if you can manage to stay awake which is the main challenge with that then uh, it's easier to be relaxed in your body. And of course, from the standing meditation, it seems to me, you know, just having practiced it for a couple of years, but that it, it's much better for energy cultivation and even more than the sitting. I mean, if you have really correct sitting posture that will cultivate energy tremendously, but that's very hard for people to learn. And it's much easier to do through the standing meditation, I think. Um, so I think sitting tends to be overemphasized for Westerners that I think there's a reason that it is overemphasized, but uh, I tend to emphasize other things when I teach personally. And when you, when you do sitting meditation, do you, what do you use? Do you use a chair or a stool or meditation cushion on the floor or? Well, um, right now I'm traveling and don't have a cushion. My absolute preferred thing would be to have a Zafu cushion on a, uh, uh, you know, on the Zabutan, which is like a pillow that's for sitting on. Um, there are certain kinds and configurations that I really like of those, but I don't have them here and basically know how to make a chair or a sofa uh, or a, even a bed work as a sitting posture. It's just about making sure that your knees are below your hips and that you have a good upright posture and are relaxed in your body. But, um, you know, sitting forward in a, a chair tends to be helpful, but even having slightly bad posture, as long as you're comfortable and relaxed and you're not straining in it too much you're not sitting in it too long like it's not worse than the other things westerners tend to do their to their bodies so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. great um anything else that you want to mention or talk about i don't think so i can't think of anything great well i'll be putting in the show notes a link to your website so that if people are interested in taking classes with you, they can learn more about you and what you do. And I've certainly really enjoyed taking classes with you. And it's been great just to get to know you better and learn more about your background and how you think about all these things. So really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you, Tasha. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. And, uh, and uh, you're, you're a great dedicated student. I love having you and uh, look forward to more. Sounds good. Thank you, Stanwood.